Hey, welcome everyone again to another uh, episode of Setter Tales podcast. I'm Wade and Thomas here, and uh, we're going to have some uh, some pretty cool things to talk about tonight. We're glad to have you with us. Um, before we get rolling, we want to make sure that this is episode 31. 31. Wow, 31. They said we wouldn't ever last this long. Um, episode 31, and it's brought to you tonight by our uh, uh, sponsor, Kinetic Performance Dog Food, and uh, we built it for our dogs and you'll love it for yours. And so check them out. Um, we've been using their product for many years, and uh, uh, they, they're great people, and they do a great some some great work with uh, with their product out there for uh, dog nutrition. So yeah, uh, I need to I need to order another shipment here. So. I know you go through a lot of dogs <laughs> dog food with the dog with the crew that you have up there, and I do too. But uh, buy ten, get the eleventh <laughs> one free. Just I don't remember have that, that many. I don't have that many to buy for, so I don't have to worry about that. But don't think the one sponsor we got right now. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. True. That's right. So, uh, but you know, we're going to get right to it. Um, obviously, we've we've talked uh, a little bit about weather and how weather changes, and that does affect the bird hunting. And it's been it was cold, it was brutally cold. We had a blizzard, and now it's warmed up again. So you never do know what's going to happen in Iowa in the winter time and what kind of conditions. And there's uh, about what two weeks of the wild bird season left, yep. I think. And so. Uh, Hopefully, if this weather kind of stabilizes and gets a little bit warmer, like it's talking about here next next week, maybe maybe we can get some some more wild bird hunting in before the before the season ends. But we'll check that out, and uh, if we do, we'll tell you about it on the next next podcast. But hey, tonight we want to talk about a breed of setter, but it's one that maybe a lot of uh, our listeners haven't really had a lot of experience with. But that's the Gordon setter, and. Uh, we've got Tom Loy on tonight, and we're going to talk to him. He's uh, with Tall Grass Gordon Setters, and he's out in the fine state of Idaho. And uh, it's kind of a bird mecca out there. I think uh, I think it's a secret, well kept by guys like Tom. You know, from us over here in the pheasant country. You know, about all the different kinds of species of birds that he can hunt out of there. But and we'll get into it a little bit. But uh, welcome to the show tonight, Tom. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's great. You, uh, uh, you know, kind of digging down a little bit into your background. I know that you've been kind of a bird hunting, upland bird hunting guy for most of your life. And you've lived in different places across the country. And probably depending on where you've lived, you've hunted those species of birds that are indigenous to that area. I think you said you lived in Michigan for a while, way back when. Is that where you grew up? Yeah, that's, I spent uh, 18 years there, my first 18 years. Um, Lived in Minnesota, North Dakota, Montana, Idaho, and Alaska. Wow. Wow. So you've hunted about every upland bird there probably is, right? I mean, for the most yeah. part, at uh, some time or other. He's probably done pheasants, obviously, if he's in North Dakota, Minnesota, and, and those places. He he probably has uh, has chased a lot of pheasants in his day. But Ptarmigan, but, probably, if, if you're yeah. in Alaska. Yep. I sh- yep. Shot a few ptarmigan um, on a caribou hunt. We went out there and there was a lot of fun saw a lot of birds um wish i had a dog would have been a lot more fun with a dog yeah Yeah. well it always is you know the dog is the is the part of it but you know what's kind of cool um and we'll get into a little bit about how you got into the gordon setter um uh, side of things and started uh, breeding those dogs they're really they're beautiful dogs and i think i i told you one time when i was talking to you before that the only gordon i ever hunted over was the one that we were hunting snipe with uh in the bogs of uh, of ireland and you said I've, I've hunted snipe before and you talked about hunting snipe up in michigan which i never even really thought about but uh but i think snipe are pretty much universal they're around different places even in iowa has yeah. them but yeah. until we hunted them over there i really hadn't really paid a lot of attention but they are like woodcock and snipe are like the big birds in ireland you know that's really what them guys are going for uh with their setters and uh so very very beautiful dogs very very cool uh, fortunately i didn't get to shoot a bird over him but uh that was that was my fault not the dog's fault but yeah. uh at some point at some point you ended up kind of falling in love with with gordons and and how did that happen what was the story and and bring us up to speed on your i guess your first gordon experience and how you decided this was the breed i probably want to stay with well uh, i'm older than i look and so so i have <laughs> In my past, I've had three short hairs, an English setter, a Brittany, a uh, plethora of Labrador retrievers, uh, an English cocker, and uh, 
I've never really found a settled dog. And, and I, I, apparently I have a, a high tolerance or low tolerance for, for anxious dogs. And so, um, so I, I heard Gordon Setters had off switches. Um, and I got a Gordon Setter in 1989 and I haven't looked back and no, no longer have footprints on the ceiling from, from all the short hairs. <laughs> so they say they're settled short hairs. They say so. Short well, hairs. Well, I have not seen. They can one. be high strung. Yeah. <laughs> so, so eighty nine, you got your first Gordon, and you decided, boy, this is this is the one. And uh, so, what else about that Gordon? Tell us a little bit about the breed and and how they hunt, and how at least how you hunt them out there in Idaho. Well, yeah, Gordon Setter is really a unique, unique <clears throat> excuse me, a unique breed. Um, if you can find a dog pretty much to satisfy any hunter's tastes. You can find one that'll go 30, 40 yards, um, hunt 30, 40 yards in the grouse woods uh, for uh, grouse and woodcock. Or you can find them in the Midwest hunting pheasants, uh, you know, 100 yard, 250 um, to 100 yard, 125 yard dog. And out here in the West, the country is pretty open. Um, and sometimes you can consider it hunting like a, a grazed cattle pasture. And the cover is really thin and the dogs can really roll. The birds aren't around every tree or every bush and you need a dog to really roll. And so my Gordons, um, they, they'll rock and roll. They'll get three, four, five, eight hundred yards at times um, in search of Hungarian partridge and chucker uh, and, and things and birds such as them. So it's um, yeah, you can. That's what you need. That's one of the buyers. What buyers need to be concerned about is the type of style that they, that how they hunt. Now, and, what, now if, if, for instance, if you brought your dogs and came to Iowa, for instance, and hunted pheasants, are those dogs like a lot of the breeds, they kind of adjust to the cover that they're in or to the, yeah. you know, I mean, so your dogs would probably, you know, uh, lower the range, you know, depending on the cover where they're hunting, if they're hunting a fence row or something, a little tighter cover versus I mean, we yes. don't have any expanses of, of ground like you have out there that you're hunting, of course. But it, it's it's hard to fathom the, the country out here um, for people that have never been here. But if I do come east, I do come east occasionally, uh, go to North Dakota and such. And the, the the cover's thicker, and the dogs shut their range down. And and if I hunt quail, or if I go up to the mountains to hunt rough grouse or blue grouse or, or spruce grouse, um, they shut their range down as well. And so. So they don't make 500 yard casts in the, in the right, pine tree. Right, of course. I, I had an old guy tell me once, and I was talking to him about English setters, and, and he you know, asked me how I preferred my dogs. And, and, and I said, well, we're pheasant hunting in heavy cover, so I don't want them out there, but I want them to have that ability. And he, he just looked at, you know, he just said, he says, one thing you have to understand is you can make a long dog short, but yes. you'll never make a short dog long. Yes. And, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, you can pull them in, they figure it out, but they can pull in like, okay, we got to stay close. But that dog that doesn't want to range, he's probably not, you know, no matter what different cover you put him in, he's probably going to have that 50 yard, 20 yeah. to 50 yard range. But you know, I got a puppy right now. She, the other day I wasn't paying attention. I was watching the old dogs and looked and like, oh boy, <laughs> she was 275, 300 going across this big open area, I thought I'd better get her turned around. And, and it took a while to get her back without being too hard on her. But oh, yeah. it's like, but then, you know, then she learned, okay, he wants me here now. And then she hunted just like the rest of them and did a good job. So, you know, they learn. I agree they that. learn. Yep. I agree with that. And they'll shut it down and they learn too. I, I take my, my dogs that like to run and I take them quail hunting just down the road here and they figure it out. They, they don't mm -hmm. go off looking for looking for birds in a different country, you know, so. Now you're, uh, I know you're just uh, 15 miles or so south of Boise, right? This is what kind yeah. of where you're located. Yes. And then, so how far do you have to go before you're in these big expanses of, of the ground that I've seen in your videos and you've been hunting? Is that pretty much out the back door for the most part? Yeah, or do you matter, really? As a matter of fact, it is my property. I have two acres here um, and I have about 4,000 acres of BLM uh, attached Butt up against the back side, north side of my property. Oh, well, and that's so, kind of a bad deal, isn't it? Oh, no, I hate that. <laughs> I have the same problem. I got 3,000 acres of public behind my house, and I just hate living there, you know. <laughs> yeah, but you do. 
<laughs> and that you do. No, it's not. It's nice. I, there's quail in my yard and, and Hungarian partridge um, that are. I got four or five coveys, six coveys some years that are accessible within a half a mile of the house. So, so I, I run my puppies. I run my puppies on wild birds, and I'm pretty lucky like that. So. So now, uh, when when people refer to the Snake River Valley, is that that is that the area where you yes. you live? Is that what they? Is that the area that we're talking yes. about? Okay. Yes. Sir. And yep. so on any given day when you go out there uh, to foot hunt, and I'm assuming you, you don't do any horseback stuff, you're pretty much a foot foot hunter like we are, right, yep. for the most part. Um, but what's kind of unique for you out there is you could run into multiple species of birds on any single hunt. Isn't that right? Yeah, yep. Uh, Hungarian partridge, shucker, quail, pretty common on the same hunt. Uh, if, you, if you go up to uh, Hell's Canyon, which is also part of the Snake River drainage, um, you can get into blue grouse, rough grouse, um, along with chucker, huns, and quail, all in the same hunt. So, wow, that yeah, would. Uh, so you could probably get a grand slam in one day, is you know, I guess what people would call a grand slam. But you could probably do all that in one day. You could. Yes. Um, and have you and, ever had one of those days where you got all species of the birds in one hunt? Uh, no, not that I recall. Not okay. that I recall. I was just curious. I never shoot that well. No, <laughs> no. I, I, I could, just I could say I might have seen those many yeah. different species, yeah. but well, and I know uh, I could have. Like just last weekend, we shot a chucker and a hun in, uh, in the same same walk, and and quail were just down on the other side of the truck. We could have. That option was available to us if we had chosen to do that. So, hmm. so in your area, it's probably <laughs> areas that are hazardous. I mean, you probably got cliffs, rock, you know, rock faces. Um, I don't know, probably in the summer, the warm areas, you probably got snakes. You probably got mountain lions. You probably got bears, yeah. a little bit of everything. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, we moved our houses surrounded by rocks. And one of my dogs got bit in the front yard by a rattlesnake a couple summers ago. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And the first year here, we killed five right around the house. Uh, and every summer we kill one or two. So the dogs usually point them, find them, and, and or whatever the case. Do you, uh, do you do any snake, snake training with those dogs or do you just? Yes, we held, uh, there's a couple clubs in town. They hold snake avoidance training in, in the summertime. Okay. And so I have done it with them and I also do my own. I find a big bull snake and, and, um, we set them up for uh, we uh, i went through the training so i see how they do it and uh i, I choose to um yeah and we do our own snake avoidance training too so yeah so they you know they always say never set a dog up for failure but like in that portion um you know one thing we would have to worry about is probably chasing deer um you know if we yeah, had we something don't really have much that hunts us back you know yeah. like uh, he would have a, out, out there but you know, yeah. you, those are in those instances, you probably just got to show them the snake and make that a hot zone. You know, they see a snake, you, yeah. you yeah, make yeah. it hot for them. You walk right by, you set up a snake big, uh, in, in a spot and have somebody spotting it, making sure it doesn't crawl away. And you le leash the dog and you walk it right right past it. And when the dog acknowledges the snake, you, you, you touch it with the e-collar. Yeah. Um, there's argument as to uh, how much intensity you want to give it. The snake avoidance club that that it does it here in boise area um they really should, they shock the dog pretty good and and that's why i choose to do it myself now um i don't i think just enough electric um, intensity in the in the e-collar um to get the dog's attention would be sufficient so yeah I don't, and, and you can mess things up if you, yeah. you know you know they always you know even in the old training books like if you want to to stop an unwanted behavior with an e-collar, you want to zap it. But if that dog, if you think that dog was acknowledging the snake and it really wasn't, it was, you stepped on its foot or, or a bee or, you know, there's so many scenarios. If you use that e-collar wrong in that situation, I mean, yeah. you might want to start low and then move high. But, you know, I know a lot of people I've read on the snake training and they just, they put the, you know, they write, they make them ride the lightning until they're like, Oh boy. And it's like, Okay, well, what if that dog was acknowledging something different and it associates something different? But, um, yeah. but granted, yeah, yeah I, I get it. 
Yeah, that's I had a Gordons are pretty soft, and uh, I had an issue with the scenario that happened, and it turned my I didn't want them to turn my dog into a sniveling pile of protoplasm, you know, and so. <laughs> And so, and that's what would have happened. And so that's why I choose to do it myself now. It's a little bit different intensity levels. I can always turn it up. You can always yeah. turn it up. Yeah. And that's, yeah. Trying to go back down is tough when they've already had the hardest setting. Yep. That, and they may not associate it with the snake. That's what, one of the things that I found is that, is that the dog didn't associate the e-collar with the snake. He, he thought it was me doing it or so, something else. It, it wasn't, yeah, it didn't associate it with the target that I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so that's, you know, you, you never know what the dog is going to think when you touch them with the e-collar. So start small. Now, what's your, what's your, uh, what's the typical hunt look like out there? I mean, do you, I know you have multiple, uh, Gordons, but do you do like, like we usually hunt a brace, like two dogs, maybe at a time yeah. together and then yeah. switch them out as we need to. Is that, is in that big open country, is that kind of how you hunt as well? It depends. Uh, it, it depends on where, where I hunt. There's more roads. Uh, I broke, <laughs> I broke an ankle chucker hunting uh, about five or six years ago. And so, um, and then two years later, I broke an ankle deer hunting up in the mountains and the other ankle. And so I stay away from country. Um, in North Dakota, now let me, I'm paraphrasing, I'm, I'm prefacing with this, this conversation with that little story. Um, in North Dakota, I hunted, there's roads every half mile or every mile. And you can go out and you can go do a hunt for an hour, hour and a half, and then come back to the truck, switch out a dog, and and um, switch out a dog, and go to another spot and have a fresh dog on the ground and give that dog a rest. Out here, there's not roads every mile or every half mile. And if you chucker hunt, and that's primarily what I used to do, you you leave the truck and you walk up a thousand, two thousand feet, and, and you start chucker hunting. By the time you're done, three, four, or five hours later, you get back to the truck. You don't want to leave the truck, and so, so you, you usually take a dog, and you have to carry water with you. So depending on the time of year, you, you have to carry. If you take two dogs, you have to carry a lot, twice as much water, and so a lot of folks don't like to do that. So a lot of folks um, will just take one dog and and and, um, and spend all day out out of the truck. And so, but where I hunt, because I broke my ankle and, you, and it was a little, I was by myself um, and no communication, there was no cell phone service. So I, I so it kind of caused a lasting impression um, on, my, on where I hunt. And so I hunt close to home here now and where there's a lot more roads, I get cell service um, and I hunt, I'll, I'll take my dogs out. I'll run, depending on how long I'm out, I'll take two dogs sometimes and I'll take one hunt an hour and a half one spot put a dog up put that dog up go to the next spot and bring a fresh dog out and so so it all depends you have all kinds of different opportunities and different types of styles to, of hunting here in idaho so i tried the four dog method this year and uh i'm never gonna do that. i've never been real <laughs> three <laughs> by I've, myself I've, it done, was... I've done three a few times and that's uh that's, that's that would be fun but... Yeah, two yeah, older yeah. dogs and a puppy, usually like a, you know, a young dog that, you know, you don't have to worry about a whole lot and just keep it in line. But I tried two adults uh, and two started younger dogs and mm. it How'd never fit. It was good. Yeah, I mean, that was a good hunt. Yeah. But as soon as I started going to the truck, everybody started peeling off and you get and somebody would peel off and you'd go, oh, man. So you'd have to walk 100 yards, get in there, go to a point, and yep. Yep. then you'd be like, all right, head back to the truck. Well, that other dog, you weren't paying attention because you're going to this point, is 80 yards. <laughs> I ended up spending like two hours, extra hours. Nobody wants to go to the truck. And Man, come on. I got my limit, but then I walked around. I finally just, um, everybody got a, a come here, and if nobody came, everybody got a correction, and we, okay, we're going to the truck. And then about every 50 yards, I'd say, I'd, I'd get a, Hey, get over, get over here. And we made it back to the truck. But at one point I was going to start walking dogs back to the truck yes. one at a time. And, and I didn't want to do that because I tried it once. And then the one dog was opposite direction. So, um, four is, is too much. Yeah. <laughs> two is two or three I can handle, but four is too much. Yeah. That is, but, that's 
would be awesome. But yeah, no, I, I carry a leash in my my vest for that reason too. You gotta, sometimes when you're heading back to the truck, they have different ideas. And, so. Yes, they do. Do you use any types of, you know, so if you're out where you have, or you're not gonna have cell phone, do you have any type like of a, an SOS? I think there's, uh, well, there's one thing you can carry, it's emergency beacon, you can hit it and it'll just tell you people where you're at. And um, I actually hunt own, own a lot. So I went with the Garmin um, 200i has yeah. in reach so i actually have an sos button on there so if i would happen to fall and hurt myself and whatever or didn't have good cell phone reception i can just hit that button is that something that you do or something you're looking into yeah all my buddies have 200 eyes like like you mentioned and um and they really like them. they used to have spots or some of the other products yep. that were out, that are out that's there that's the one i was thinking of yeah yeah they used to have those and they upgraded to the 200 i because it has more flexibility mm -hmm. and they could probably you can see each other that's one of your options on your new collar wade that well we haven't can, got to that part trade. Of the, we haven't got to that part of the ground <laughs> you school can yet. trade areas re with each other um yeah. Yep. yeah so you know we when we go through everything we ask all the questions but you know what started you on on upland you know we all have that mentor or that person that started us and and you know wade you know his his grandfather got him into it when he was a young boy and my dad got me into it so we kind of like to dig into that little portion of of uh, what gave you the passion to start what you're doing now gotcha yeah i started out uh my dad was a waterfall hunter we hunted big water um canvasbacks redheads bluebills and stuff i started uh my dad used to have uh, wood decoys um so up in the great lakes area lake st Clair flats area and that was my first memory and rabbit, but, and then my other areas uh, um, that I remember are jumping on brush piles for cottontail hunting. I used to remember that. And that, that was a lot of fun. Um, and, and we started, we did a little pheasant hunting. I was down in Alabama. This is a, a story, I guess. Uh, I was down in Alabama and, and well, probably about 14 years old. My uncle uh, had a bunch of buddies down there and they had these big raw bone uh, English pointers and we were hunting this peanut field and had, there were three or four dogs on the ground. I don't recall exactly. And they all went on point around the base of a power pole and, and everyone, you know, all high tailed and all these big staunch English pointers. And, and one of the guys, everyone crowded around was watching the dogs. <clears throat> one of the guys smoking a cigarette the cigarette on the ground stopped it out. He says, about time we flesh these birds, boys. And so um, I, uh, we, we, somebody walked in and I shot my first Bob White Coil. And right then I knew I was going to be a dog guy. So <laughs> that was my first experience really with upland bird hunting. Um, you know, like I said, I've been duck hunting and rabbit hunting. Uh, I'd never experienced quail hunting until Alabama. So, And, you know, it, it's funny. Everybody's got that story that a dog got them to do it you know um yeah i don't think i'd be an upland hunter at all you know i duck hunted too and my lab ultimately passed a couple years ago and i had I have zero inkling to want to go duck hunting again um yeah i got friends that do it and they have dogs but it's, it's not my dog so it's like yeah whatever yeah he picked up the bird big deal you know and but that feeling you get when your dog goes on point or your dog flushes a bird and in my case, lately, even if you miss a bird, you still got that experience of, you know, I mean, you even, you know, this was, you were a kid when this happened and you remembered the exact scenario. I mean, down to the guy flicking the cigarette down onto the ground and, and you know, you, you, I mean, you even said they're all high tailed and that's just something that yeah. I guess me and you relate to is that, and, and Wade too, is that you remember those days because of what the dogs did, you know, and then you kind of relate to everything around it. Yeah, yeah, yep. I, I, I love it. I, I, I love hunting right behind bird dogs. I was a duck hunter too for a long time, um, but then I started not wanting to get up early in the morning. Pheasants and sharp tails and Hungarian partridge are, are still there at ten thirty in the morning. <laughs> Good so, point. Good point. Good point. So right yeah. now, are you, are you buried in snow right now, or are you able to get out and run dogs and go hunting? Or no, able, um, our season ends about the 31st of January, 
and uh, we had snow about four or five inches, but it rained and we, um, we have little patches here and there, probably about 70, 60 percent coverage, 70 percent coverage. Okay. But, yeah, I know uh, part of the Montana area, they got up to in North Dakota, they got feet of snow. So yeah, in South yeah, Dakota, did. so they're pretty much shut down. I have uh, my, my kids live in North Dakota and there's four or five feet on the ground. Wow. So in some places. Now so. you were telling me before that if you had your preference that 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 bird of choice that you usually like to go after on any given day um, is that is that hun right is that what you were telling me is yeah yep yeah why yep. is that I mean what what about that bird does it just gives you that you know if I've got a if I could only hunt one last bird you know before uh, the you know the Lord Almighty says it's time to time to leave uh, what bird would it be and it sounds like for you it would be that hun right. Well, yeah, I, I think it's mostly because I'm I'm right in the middle of hunt country. Is it's that's a help too. But um, but Hungarian partridge are really cool for dogs, for bird dogs, and it, it's it's like an art form watching the dogs search out the cover, run they run the to the objectives, use the wind. Um, it, I, I kind of like feel like it's almost like like a ballet, a choreographed ballet. Um, it's beautiful to watch the dogs, and I guess that's what that's what I like about it. I, I, this time of year, I shoot an old Ivor Johnson single shot 12 gauge. And so it's not about shooting birds, you know, and um, I, the Huns are tough to handle. Um, they're tough for dogs. Not all dogs can handle them. They have to really respect the birds. Um, they have to search the country um, and they have to handle to you. They have to know where you're at. Um, it, a lot of sagebrush in some areas and, and the dogs got they have to respond to you and they have to want to be with you. And so uh, it's, it's like, a, it's like, it's beautiful. I guess it's, if you now, don't think that, if you don't think yeah. running a bird dog is beautiful, then maybe you shouldn't be doing it. You know? no, that's yeah. true too. But they're a cubby, they're a cubby bird, like a quail. They, they cubby in, in larger numbers. Typically yes. when you find them, there'll be a, a covey of birds. Um, yep. Now, how, how large a covey do you typically see? Uh, does that vary depending on, uh, on uh, obviously on cover or location or what the weather conditions have been in the spring or hatches and all those other uh, all those other variables or how does that work? All those variables do play a role on cubby size. Um, this year has been a really good year as far as cubby size is concerned. Uh, we're getting many cubbies in the 10 to 15 numbers. Uh, in Montana, when I hunted them in Montana, there were, that was quite often that number. Uh, quite often high numbers of birds in the coveys. Uh, out here, it's, um, typically it's in the six to eight or 10 is usually a typical number of birds in a covey. Um, huns are, you, huns don't know, people don't know a lot about Hungarian partridge. Usually there'll be a nice covey, eight, 10, 12 birds, and then there'll be a satellite covey. And that satellite covey is last year's adults that didn't, that didn't uh, uh, have broods or our bachelors or whatever the case may be. Um, so you'll have a big covey of, uh, of a brood from that year's brood and then the smaller satellite covey. Um, and, and the birds are pretty territorial. They'll stay, if I find a bird, if I find a covey or two in the same um, same area, and then usually within a quarter mile of that area, that's where that covey is going to be. Um, now, and, do, you have, do you have some etiquette about Okay, so you you get a covey up and you take a bird or two, then mm -hmm. do you move on or do you hunt singles or do you move on and try to leave that covey alone after you've taken a bird or how how do you how do you usually uh, deal with that? Well, it depends on who's with me. If I do if I have new folks with me and early in the year when a covey hasn't been messed with, they'll they'll land within three, four, five hundred yards if you can see them. If it, if it's not overrise, but if you see them land. Um, I'll, I'll go. I have. Um, I'll go and try to locate those birds again. It depends on if I have new folks with me. I hunt with people a lot, uh, with other people a lot. But if people hunt with me, I have a personal li limit of two. I don't okay. shoot more than two Hungarian partridge every time I'm out. Um, and and anyone that hunts with me also has is, they'll have that limit as well, or else they won't hunt with me. Gotcha. So, what what's so. the state limit? I mean, I assume there is a limit on the number you can take per day. Seven. Is that seven? Okay. Yeah. So yeah. you so you get your and I'm guessing if you get your two birds that could that could maybe be a pretty early day or that could be a in some yeah. some instances an all day hunt right? 
So well, that's why yeah, he carries I, a single shot. <laughs> that's, why, that's why I carry, and I hunt with other people so we can take turns, take turns on the points. And so, it, it, it's not about chicken is ninety nine cents a pound at the you know the chicken thighs <laughs> ninety nine cents a pound at the grocery store. Yeah, you know, that's so exactly it's not about right. for me. It's not about that. And so I don't want to impose my morals on other people, but I'm just yeah. you're asking me questions, so I'm telling you what I feel. Sure. Yeah, and that we we, we respect that. Now I know too. you do some guided hunt uh yeah at yep. time where you take clients out is that do you how often do you do that is that are you pretty busy with that or is that kind of a hit and miss kind of a thing that you're doing well, kind of, i just started that and it's just been word of mouth uh, i got permission on some private property adjacent to my place here um and and they uh, they were very kind in giving me some per the permission to do that um, and there's a bunch of valley quail down there and there's a few hungarian partridge as well and uh so my only clients have been um, uh, guys older than me, so I'm 62, and and, and um, so this country is not for old men. And so this, so the place that I have down here is really flat, and a nice valley, and and there's a little bit of structure, a little bit of elevation change if we really want to go up and, and hunt hunt on top of the ridges and stuff. So so it's it's been fun, and and we'll see in a good day. We'll see a couple hundred valley quail in an hour or two. Wow! Wow! So how, it's how hard are they to, to how, it's hard how to are they are how are they to hunt the valley quail? Are they kind of similar to Bob White's and how they uh, mm -hmm. uh, how they covey up and how they react to to the dog work and that kind of thing, or do they are they runners more so? They're runners. I think they're okay. perfect, really. Yeah. So <laughs> so they run a lot, and then they'll stick if they get broke up, and if there or if there's snow on the ground, they'll stick and hold real tight. Um, but you never know what they're going to do. We had yesterday I was out and I had a couple of folks over that I, I, we ran their dogs. They had some new dogs and, and we saw probably 150, 200 birds. Um, but the dog, the, the birds were flushing wild and, and we did get a couple points on some singles that held tight. Um, but we saw a lot of birds in the air before we dogs even got there. So it's, it's yeah, hard kinda, telling. Kind of like a miniature pheasant then. It happens. It, it, yeah, yeah. Right. That's why they call it hunting, I guess, right? And so, so some days you just don't know what you're going to get. So yeah. kind of give us a history of, you know, of tall grass and a little bit, you know, for a lot of people and, and not everybody's gotten the chance to hunt with a Gordon and some people don't even have, don't even know what one looks like. You know, I I've, I've had the pleasure of hunting with a really really nice Gordon Center and yeah. and uh my friend John was actually on the show with us and talked about his Gordon Centers and and uh so but but kind of tell us give us a little skinny you know on your knowledge of, of that dog and and uh you know and the knowledge on your dogs as well right right it's a um, little history on the gordons as they were developed in scotland duke of gordon had a kennel uh with all different types styles of dogs white red um, and black and tan and they they were believed to have been um, interbred and um but the gordon Duke of Gordon really liked the black and tan ones, and uh, and so, long story short, they kind of developed them, and, and, and AKC got a hold of it, and they made a breed club, and they, and and they kind of separated them out: the English setters and the Irish setters, and and uh, and the Gordon setters. And so, uh, they were originally developed for hunting uh, the European birds such as red grouse and the moors. And so, um, many people. Many people can argue over all the, the all this, um, but I believe that they were uh, smaller dogs. Like 25 inches was was a, was a large dog back in the uh, late 1800s, um, and and they had some range. They had range to them because they it was open country, and those red grouse weren't around every bush, you know. And so so they had to search the country, and so so that's what I think the Gordons were developed from and were developed into. Uh, when they were brought over to the United States, they were brought over and they were pretty much high restricted to just the North, Northeast country. Um, I think um, Webster, uh, so, so the guy who did the Webster dictionary, I can't remember his first name. Anyway, he imported the first Gordon setters and they're turned into rough grouse and woodcock dogs. And that's what they've typically been for a long, long time. And that's why out in the West, you don't see many because they're pretty much a Northern tier or Northeastern style dog. And so, and they kind of migrated west, and and um, so I told you the story about why I enjoy the Gordons because they have an off switch, and they can settle in the house really well. Uh, and and 
Um, what was, uh, I guess, help me out here. I guess I'm kind of got well, lost. No, we're, we were just interested in how you kind of got your kennel going and, oh, you know, how, how many, how many litters you try to put on the ground a year or that kind of thing. Gotcha. Uh, um, I, I, I got my kind of going. I was in the military. I retired from the military in 2002. Uh, and uh, I've had Gordon since 89, like I mentioned. Uh, and I really liked it. And I thought, well, I'm going to try the, I'm going to try breeding them. I think this would be, I think this would be kind of fun. Um, so when I retired, I had my first litter and I really enjoyed it. What I really, what I really enjoy is, is listening to my puppy buyers. They call me up and they say, hey, Tom, this is a really nice dog. This the dog is doing X, Y, Z, and so on and so forth. I didn't know much about breeding dogs. Um, I didn't know about OFA. And, and certainly there weren't DNA tests back then to determine health issues. Um, and as as technology started advancing, I, I started learning more. I, I listened to a few folks. And, and then I started OFA in my dogs. And I started DNA testing my dogs for health and stuff. Um, I started playing in AKC and some of the some of the field trial games, uh, Nastra. Uh, I've been in the one NAVDA event um, and and AKC field trials, um, and that has really the AKC field trial style, um, high tails, high head, has really driven my preference for Gordon Shutters, and 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 has kind of um, that's what I look for in uh, in the stud dogs and in the female dogs. If none of my dogs all my dogs have placements in field trials. They're not champions, but they at least have placements in all breed field trials. Um, and that's what I look for. So the dog that be, can, can be competitive in, uh, with, with, uh, with other breeds. And so that's important to me. And so, so that's where I'm, that's where I'm going with my, with my kennel and with, uh, with my breed, with my dogs. So do you have a litter a year or more than that? Yeah. I have a litter a year, sometimes two. Uh, so, <laughs> Try not to have too many oops litters, you know. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I, I use my mail sparingly because, um, and I try to search other areas uh, and other dogs. Uh, bettering the breed is really important to me. It get um, the breed whenever you breed dogs, it has a tendency to migrate towards the median, towards the average, and so you need dogs that are above average in order to to have better than average puppies, and so, so. I search out and I look for dogs that, that are early starting, um, dogs that would hunt with you. Early starting, I mean dogs that will point birds and let you walk in in front of them and flush before they're well before they're a year old. You know, so um, I don't want to I don't want to have to tell somebody that he's got to wait three years for the dog to start pointing birds. That's right, right. Just in time there, you know. Yeah, and natural I, build, natural breeding for natural ability is is really a big thing that, that I look into. In, yeah. You know, and, and so I, and, yeah, I call it early starting, you yeah. know, early starting dogs. I had a, I had a buyer talk to me or, uh, I sold the dogs about a year old now. I, he was, wasn't really into bird dogs. Um, this was his first pointing dog and he moved to Montana and I, I told him, I said, he was caught curious and he was a little anxious about training the dog. I said, just take that dog hunting with you. Just take it out, walk in the fields, no pen raised birds. Pen raised birds cause problems on earth if you don't know what the heck you're doing. Um, I got a text from him about a month ago and, uh, at the start. No, I'm sorry, at the start of the Montana pheasant season. Um, his text read something similar to I've taken that dog hunting twice. The second time I took that dog hunting, it pointed, I got shot two limits of birds, or we shot two limits of birds over points. And that's the he had no formal training. And that dog held points long enough for the guy to walk in and shoot two limits of pheasants. So that's awesome. And, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. And that's, you know, and selling a dog or, or breeding a dog or whatever and having, just having that happen, you know, is, 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 is good for your soul too. And you, you know, yeah. you've strived for that in your breeding program. We do understand that there may be a litter of puppies behind that door. Yeah, I think we should probably get one on camera. Yeah, let's see what that puppy looks so so people can see what that right, yeah. looks Let me like. Go see if I can find. Hold on. All righty. For those of our audience who are listening to audio only, it's adorable. <laughs> All puppies, but specifically setter puppies. Yes.
Well, it sounds like he's got, man, it sounds like he's got a lot of opportunity to hunt different oh, species of birds. Can you imagine I, that? I mean, if you just walk out your back door and, you know, encounter quail or grouse or you know, Yeah, you're just like, hmm, what am I going to see today? That's amazing. <clears throat> well, even in the same hunt, you never yeah, know what's going to come up. I did see a hung, hun today on the side of the road on in my travels for work, but I did not have a dog nor a gun. Oh, look at that. Wow. Wow. That's a beauty. So yeah. look at that. Now what how old is that dog there? He's um eight weeks tomorrow. Eight weeks. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. I do notice um on some of the pictures I've seen of them and some of the videos, they might have a little longer ear than what I would say on, mm -hmm. you know what my English setters have. Yep. Yep. Okay. This it depends on the dog. Um some of the field lines, some of the field lines I have here, um the, ears can vary in length mm -hmm. and the placements on the head this one's got pretty low set ears um, some of them can have higher set the field bred dogs um, can have a little bit higher set ears and and so and so yeah um, yeah the ears are a little bit different i like the lower set ears it's more of a gordon look yeah man they are good looking they are they are yeah. in my bucket list of dogs um to go on, yeah. so so it, what the the so this is pretty much the standard color and yep. how the dogs are all marked, or are there some variants in how their muzzles marked, or their, I mean, oh, you can have it... a white spot on them. You, sometimes you can get a, boy, a white. I think somebody does a white blaze. No, I don't think so. You might have a white blaze on them here. Um, okay. There are off-color dogs. You'll find some off-color um, dogs that'll look like English setters, um, but it doesn't happen too often. It's not on. It's not not uncommon to happen, but. Um, but some breeders have it more so than others. Now, how big will this pup get? Will it get will it get to that forty pound dog or fifty pound yeah. dog? Or yeah, I think this one this one's a male, and so he'll probably be about fifty pounds. Okay, give or take a few. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think the ones that I've hunted with, um, they're probably that forty pound range. They're a little shorter yep. dog compared yep. to you know a big tall legged. But but man, did that little guy he was. <laughs> He covered ground and and did it swiftly and and I you know that I was like man I, I think I might have to have one of them at some time and and very, I just I just like the the black and tan and, yeah they're very cool um as far as hair on them or is that they have kind of a maybe a silkier coat on them yes. versus um yeah. you know some of our setters they'll have a real nice soft fluffy coat and mm -hmm. and then I got one at home that's just coarse haired and do they kind of stay that silky smooth or do they get a, a variation of hair and yes it seems they like do. the one with the coarse hair sheds a lot more than the one that's got a little softer hair on it huh. yeah you can get a harder coat one and then there you got the fluffy cottony coat and so sometimes when you shave a dog if you shave the dog down it'll turn a coarse coat into a fluffy cottony coat um so you got to watch that too but you don't know that's going to happen until you do yeah. it the problem so yeah but yeah some of, some of my dogs have a closer coat i have one here that's really really close really nice short coat and then i have another one that's fairly long coated and i have to trim him a couple times a year so so you you mentioned an off switch so you know you know most of the people that are, are watching this or listening have no clue that you have five of them laying in <laughs> behind you no you can hear them moving uh, around a little bit but even Where they, yeah, out, I see them, you but... got you got up and went out the door. I saw the one on behind your right shoulder lift its head up. I'm like, I wonder where he's oh, going, yeah. and then immediately I, laid down. So I'm not sure mine would have stayed in. No, mine would have. I would have had ours. like the, the line of elephants, you know, how you see on TV <laughs> where they're all hooked to nose to tail, and um, like, do they know you grab the gun or you grab the collar or they hear the tailgate drop? They're probably ready to go and and get rolling. They, they figure out as soon as I put my boots on. Soon, yeah, as soon as I put my, yeah, they know how I dress, and so, so I dress. Every, I think everyone dresses specifically for the field, and so they figure it out pretty quick. Yeah, so that's that's for sure. And they get anxious, and they'll. There are we in the Gordon world. There are barkers as well, and you know, and um, just like every other dog, if they get left behind, they get anxious. You know, so. But this this one's starting to get a little. Frisky now. But. Yeah. You know, my, 
there's two there like i an old guy always told me he said there's two dogs you never have to teach to bark and one's a beagle and the other one's a setter <laughs> <laughs> well if the coyotes show up here and they start barking at the coyotes that's for yeah. sure now do you have to worry about the coyotes in your area as far as the dogs or are the dogs smart enough just to say hey we're just going to avoid that or do you ever have to deal with that when you let them out at night or anything like that during the uh, during the pups when the pups are on the when the coyotes are having pups they'll be more territorial um but usually when, when we see coyotes they're usually high talent for someplace else okay so unless they come around that like i said we um we have we have open country behind us and they'll show up on the rim every now and then the rim behind the house. And, um, we get to see them occasionally, but they don't bother too much. Okay. So, I, I've heard stories, people where the coyotes will, uh, trail will, will try to lure a dog away. Um, but that, that, that that's not, never, never happened to one of my buddies. So hmm. what are you doing? So no, they're not too bad. We have mountain lions here too. And I, I guess I'm maybe a little bit, when the elk move in um, this time of year, the mountain lions will follow them down. And so, and so that's, I'm a little more concerned with the mountain lions. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, I watched the, the mountain men series and stuff like that. And I noticed, you know, when they, those guys are chasing them away and, you know, as soon as the, the snow gets deep, anything that eats meat starts coming downhill because they're just following the game. Well, that, so. that was the story I was, or the, question i had too was when you are out there in that big expanse of wide open country then do you carry a sidearm another kind of sidearm for you know in case you do encounter some kind of predator like that or do you just some people do. rely on your shotgun yeah i've had buddies that shot mountain lions and and they had seen mountain lions um stalking their dogs um while they've been out and the shotgun is enough to scare them off um and that one guy actually killed one uh, with his shotgun it was, it was close enough that he killed it with birdshot you know wow so yeah that's too close yeah that's pretty close that's, that's pretty too close. close yeah yeah they yeah they say well you can't shoot them unless they're within danger but if i can shoot, <laughs> shoot it with my 12 gauge and kill it that's too close yeah that's pretty close <laughs> yeah. I think so but uh, yeah you we know. appreciate we appreciate the i think it's great that we get to see uh, and talk about the garden and like I said, just don't see a lot of them uh, here, and uh, would love to hunt over one of them uh, again because they're just a beautiful, beautiful you dog. Want to, to come out and give it a try. Well, we might have to do that if I, but you probably have to take me to that old man field that you were talking about <laughs> earlier. You know where the where the it's my, re the, it's my retirement plan. Is that yes, old man yeah, the, where the go. field is flat and yeah, yeah, old guys go to hunt for the last time. Yeah, that's yeah, probably what we I'm. We always tell for. everybody, you know, you're always welcome to come out here and 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 get in the the heavy tall grass and you know we brought the guys from ireland and you know they didn't know what they were going to yeah. see and they uh they're like oh boy and that's probably what you're going to think when you come and hunt that and then we're i mean you've hunted it but that's probably what we're going to say if we pull up and there's we got to walk a thousand feet up to get to the birds yeah i don't mind him where he's talking about that grass that's about that high now, i could i don't i, I could yeah. i could handle that as yeah. long as it as long as it doesn't go up through those canyons and yeah. stuff maybe yeah. it'd be okay but yeah well, i don't know uh, i would like a mountain lion rug on the wall but don't yeah, take yeah, me there on yeah. purpose don't get me but we usually we usually wrap up when we do our episodes uh tom we usually have have our guests uh relate to us uh a favorite dog story and everybody has one especially uh uh, people like you that have been raising dogs and hunting dogs for the number of years that you have. But um, you, you've, you obviously told one that is very important to you and your memory in, in, in the Alabama trip, but is there another favorite dog story maybe about one of your Gordons that, is, that comes to mind that yeah, when yeah. you talk about a favorite dog story? Yeah. Um, we were out, oh, it, was, it was a couple of years ago, and I was out with my buddy, and he's, he was, he's a, my buddy is Frank Wright, and we were we were hunt we were hunting this one area. It was pretty open, not much sage, and you can see a long way. You could see a half you could see a uh, half mile, mile, um, and not much. You could see a dog run that far, and and, uh, and when he was out there doing it, and we were, he's been Frank was has been a field trialer for 40, 45 years, American field and English pointers, and he's in the Britneys right now. He's eighty, about eighty years old. Anyway, I'm just prefacing it and setting the setting the stage. 
anyway, we were out hunger and walking on this one big open valley, and there was ridges of rocks on one side, and the wind was coming coming across from our uh, from right to left, and and I had one of my Gordons, my, my Zoli dog. Um, she was up on the other side, she's probably 600 yards away, and you could see her just hitting the rock piles as the wind was coming across, and it was just, it was beautiful, just watching her, watching her going forward, um, going forward, hitting those rock piles, watching the wind, and, and Frank, he stopped me and says, Tom, just look at that, that's beautiful, it's like it brings a tear to my eye, just watching that dog do what it was bred to do. You know, and and so and I remember that that was for Frank tell, to tell me that because he's seen a lot of dogs in his days being a field trial judge for forty plus years. Right. You know, and for him to say for him to say that's just beautiful. I felt, yeah, it was it was really cool. Yeah, and, really- and that's I love getting. You know, I um, that reminds me. I just hunted. You know, walking this drift that's eight foot off the ground and and kind of up on a side hill and and letting the dogs just go. We'd kind of hunted the area like there's got to, they can scratch more birds out. And I stood up on that drift for, I don't know, half hour until I'm like, man, I'm getting cold to the point where I'm like, I got to keep moving. But just watching them dogs work that area and, and, you yeah. know, they'd catch a scent or something and that wind coming around, you know, this area. And, and you're right. It's a poetic yeah, ballet or however you want to, describe it but you just kind of get this artistry warm. and it's the only it's, way i've heard it described it's just artistry in motion it really is and that's yeah, kind of why we all do it it's not like you said for the killing the you know the birds and saying well i gotta get my limit it's it's the dogs and watching yeah. the dogs do what they were bred to do that's it that's the you gotta, you gotta carry a gun you gotta shoot a bird every now and then because it's not you're not you're, you're hunting you're hiking then there's that's the point of it all but but man, that's not the, that's not the sole purpose of it. It's well, it's being art. outdoors, being outdoors, and seeing, uh, being able to enjoy uh, uh, that kind of wide open part of the country, which doesn't exist, you know, is it's getting harder and harder to find as uh, as as the years go by. And so, yeah, yeah, you're blessed to be out there in some really great country. My buddies, my buddies told me to tell you that, that Idaho is full and there's no birds left. So. <laughs> We, I say the same thing to everybody about Iowa. Yeah, yeah. Well, you tell him, even if we came out there uh, with our shooting, we wouldn't really uh, cause much of a dent in the wild yeah. bird population, probably. But uh, yeah, it'd be, it would be, so, sir, it would be, it'd be fun to see, you know. And I've, like I said, I've hunted in South Dakota and that's been fun. But, um, and I've been out west and never got a chance to, uh, to bird hunt there, but just the openness of the country and, and, uh, you know, it's yeah, Idaho is seventy one percent public land, and that's hard to fathom for folks back east. And you can pretty much go all kinds of places and and um, and have opportunities at, at, at some sort of upland game bird, um, which is really cool. Um, but you're welcome anytime. It would be a lot of fun to take you out for. We can love- take a tour. <laughs> we can just. Well, I'm retired, so I can. Yeah. I don't have to come back at any given time. You're the poor guy that still has to work for a living, yeah, so you know I can go. I could go on one of them two week uh, road trips and yeah. you know make the loop down don't, through all the all the western states. Yeah, you but. can stop rubbing that in anytime. Though. <laughs> yeah, here's something. Here's something that I had a guy come out uh, last year. I had a guy. I sold a puppy to a guy, um, and he he came from South Carolina. Oh wow! He drove out here uh, during hunting season. I said, "Well, bring a couple of dogs and spend a couple of days, and I'll take you hunting." And I said, but you need to bring boots. You need for your dogs. You need your dogs have to get conditioned. We have a lot of lava rock, and it really it's t- tough on them. And so he drove out here from South Carolina, picked up a puppy, I took him hunting. His dog was on the ground for 25 minutes, and then he carried it back to the truck. And that was the last time his dogs hit the ground. And so because his dogs tore up his feet in 25 minutes. Oh my! Wow. wow so if, if that's my advice: is make sure you're you're. If you don't have your dog's condition to really tough conditions, then bring dog boots. Sure. Okay. Oh, we got a lot of gravel roads around yeah, here. They yeah. lead to nowhere. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's Running on snow and ice sometimes does it uh, for yep. us too. Ice, but ice is a bad one. Yeah. Yep. Tom, we appreciate it. Thanks so much for uh, taking the time this evening to uh, give us an insight, or kind of a window into Gordon Setters. Beautiful dogs. Uh, yeah. And I, I understand this litter is going to their new home here soon. Yep, and yep. Uh, and that's both. great. 
and I, it won't be long. That dog there will be having a bird in his nose probably. So, uh, and that's the fun part. That's the fun part. Tom, is there a, a Facebook page or a website that they can they can just type in Tallgrass Gordon Setters and find some of your stuff? Yeah, uh, I have a website, uh, TallgrassGordonSetters.com. I also have a YouTube channel, um, and you can do search, uh, do a search for Tallgrass Gordon Setters, and I have about eight or nine videos there of my dogs hunting and pointing and um, and other things that I find interesting. Um, and I also um, I started a Facebook page called Field Bred Gordon Setters. Um, you can search that out on you can search that out on on Facebook and ask. It's a private page, so you can ask to join. Um, and if you're interested in Gordon Setters, then we'll let you join. Uh, there's a bunch of breeders on there. Um, we have about thousand or three thousand members now, um, and there are like I say a bunch of breeders and a bunch of um, well experts. <laughs> awesome. so, so you can always ask questions and learn more about the gordon setters um well, uh, it's not terrific. my job I, I don't really want to sell you one of, i don't have to sell you one of my dogs but if you if you uh, if I, i'll help you find a dog that would suit your needs so awesome tom well we sure appreciate yeah. it and be sure to check all his stuff out and we appreciate everybody for sticking yeah, with us and absolutely and uh you know i got a I got some, we got about two weeks left here for, for our pheasant season. And I got a lot of that planned out, I hope. And, and I'm hoping, I'm thinking I'm going to head to Kansas next. So I know you've been talking that is about on my that. list and I'm already getting it set up. So yeah. I'm excited for that. And, and any flat uh, ground down there that you're going to be hunting on. I don't, you know, what? it's just getting out of this crap we got up here for weather <laughs> and, you know, 80 degree temperature swings and, and 50 mile hour winds when it's snowing and just get away from it. A lot of people go to Cancun. I'm going to go to Kansas. So, um, but, um, you know, while we wrap up here, be sure to check out our, our Facebook page. Um, listen to us, catch up, give us a subscribe, uh, YouTube. You can uh, subscribe to us on YouTube, ring the little bell uh, underneath the episode. That way, every time we post a new one, it's going to give you a notification and, and, you know, just check us out. It helps us uh, check our numbers. And if you have any questions or any questions you want for our guests, um, you know, shoot us a message. We'd love to. And I think we're going to, I'd like to try some night where we just have a, you know, have questions you phone us in or, or uh, text or message us on our Facebook pages or whatever. And, and we'll try and have a little question and answer and ask question session type thing. And, and if there's anything you want to hear us talk about or anybody you'd like us to interview, just, just let us know. And, and we're open to uh, many suggestions. And in the meantime, when you're out there, get in the field. Keep their nose in the wind. See you next time.